Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. We have before us today in our gospel reading a pair of bickering brothers, family arguing about an inheritance. And this is all that we know about them. And given that the ancient laws regarding inheritances are notably sticky, and the more money you have, the stickier they get, and given that, it would make sense that upon seeing Jesus, this just and righteous rabbi, that they would see an opportunity for an arbiter, someone to settle things once and for all. And Jesus, being Jesus, of course, he brings them not a quick, clean answer, but he brings them a story. And so that is what I have for you this morning as well. I came across a wonderfully compelling story this week when I was listening to uh, Mo Rocca's podcast, Mo Bituaries, and it just pushes at our parable a bit today. And so I'd like to bring you part of that story. So, in Mount Airy, North Carolina, the town where the Andy Griffith Show was filmed, there is a museum of local history. And upstairs, you will find cases and cases of Mayberry memorabilia and show staging. There's a gift shop there featuring Barney Fife mugs and OP t-shirts. But downstairs in the basement, there is a, another exhibit hall that features a different local superstar. Two local superstars, to be exact. It's an exhibit dedicated to Mount Airy's own conjoined twins. Chang and Ang Bunker. And there's a picture of those conjoined twins on the cover of your bulletin today. The exhibit was all about their messy, complicated, yet surprisingly fruitful, if not always pleasant, quest for what we might call nowadays the great American dream. Chang and Ang were born on a houseboat in 1811, that was in Thailand, which we called Siam in those days. And the boys grew up healthy and active, just typical boys, other than the fact that they were connected by about five inches of flesh and tissue and organ right at their middle. They even shared a belly button at that connection point. In Thailand, they were not raised as curiosities as they would become in America eventually. They were not thought of as particularly limited or disabled. They were just Chang and Ang. And they had the same responsibilities as the rest of their family. This pair grew up being responsible for the ducks in the family, collecting eggs and taking them to the market, doing their part in support of their community. It wasn't until an American merchant spotted them swimming together one day, where they were told that that thing that makes them unique could also be very profitable. That merchant spent the next five years petitioning the king of Siam again and again for permission to take the boys from the country with him to America. It's unclear how Chang and Ang felt about being taken away from Thailand or if they really knew what they were getting themselves into. But nevertheless, the twins set sail for America in 1829 at the age of 17. They spent four months at sea, learning how to play chess, climbing up the mast, picking up English from the sailors. And the America that greeted them was young and industrializing Andrew Jackson was just elected its present president. But it wasn't exactly a place that was particularly cultured. It wasn't busting forth with entertainment possibilities or Hollywood at that point. And so Chang and Ang were an instant hit. Within months, they were a household name. There were headlines across the country about the great Siamese twin. Chang and Ang are where that expression came from. They were the original Siamese twins. 
People from all over would come just to see them lift weights or do a somersault or do some sort of acrobatics. They even had this act where they played badminton between each other. They put on a show. But Chang and Ang were far from the sideshow freaks for people to gawk at. In fact, that kind of circus culture didn't yet exist. And they really gave as good as they got. They were incredibly witty men. Once during a show, there was a one-eyed man present, and they called out that they would be willing to refund half his ticket cost because, after all, he was only catching half the show. In big cities, they were invited into places like the Masonic Hall to perform for the community. In small towns, they were invited to perform in living rooms, or they even popped up a tent in town square. They were a national sensation. Not only were they fascinating because they were conjoined twins, but they were among the first Asians in America. This was decades before all the Chinese came over in droves to help with the building of the railroad. Doctors poked and prodded them. Herman Melville alluded to them in Moby Dick. There was a rom-com written about them that circulated in newspapers. And Mark Twain even wrote extensively about them. If there was a People magazine in 1830, they would probably be on the cover of it rather regularly. But along with the fame, they were also the brunt of a lot of meanness and indignity. Once when they were traveling through Alabama, there was a doctor there that seemed to think that the twins were trying to pull a fast one on the town. And after tearing them up one side and down the other, the doctor said to one brother, what will happen if I poke you in the arm with my needle? And the other brother said, if you poke my brother in the arm with a needle, I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> Over the years, the twins had to deal with exploitative managers, treating them like slaves, racism, people not knowing what to do with an Asian neighbor. They had to deal with jeers and laughter when their wit fell short. Eventually, the twins grew weary of being a curiosity for people's entertainment. And when they saw the Blue Ridge Mountains for the first time, they were reminded of their Siam. They were reminded of the family that they left behind and their dream of building a normal life together. And so they stayed put in Mount Airy, North Carolina, of all places. They bought land, built it into a plantation, became ridiculously wealthy. They became official American citizens, and eventually, they got married. Chang married Adelaide Yates, who legend had it, they fell for each other hard at a wet friend's wedding. And Ang married her sister, Sarah Yates, who, legend has it, took a bit of persuading. But it was before their wedding that they all sat down together and had a really, a really raw kind of conversation about whether or not the twins should attempt to be separated. It wasn't something that Chang and Ang had ever really wanted before for themselves, but now there were others in the mix, wives whom they loved and were preparing to commit their lives to. And so the decision was kind of left to Adelaide and Sarah. And it was their decision that, no. They took the position that they would rather have the twins together and alive than separate and dead. And that they would make it work together, the four of them. And in a double wedding on April 14th, 1843, they sealed the deal. In the years to come, they established this two-household kind of system. Chang and Adelaide's world was on one side of the river. Aang and Sarah's life was on the other. They each had a home, and they each had a portion of the plantain that, plantation that they oversaw. And they kept this rigid schedule of three days and three nights at one home, three days and three nights at the other. And it worked for them. The plantation was successful, the marriage, though unique, was happy, 
and the family brought about 21 children into this world. I'll leave the details of that to your imagination, although I am told that they both claim to be masters of meditation. By all accounts, Chang and Ang were loving, devoted fathers and husbands, and they worked hard at respecting their brother's parenting and marriage partnership. There is something sort of moving in all of this. Imagine being stuck together with your sibling for your whole life. Imagine the effort that it would take, mind, body, and spirit, not to throttle them day in and day out. Imagine the effort that it would take to respect their person while being bound to each other. Imagine the effort that it took to uplift their uniqueness, their very selves. I can't help but think that Chang and Ang were indeed the masters of selflessness and patience. They could never give each, up, give each other up physically or otherwise. And if you look at that picture on the cover of the bulletin, this was taken just a few years before they died. They were about 60 in that photo. And this was typical for them. This was their posture. They both dressed well throughout their lives, and they stood with one arm resting around the shoulders of the other. Consider that. In order for them to negotiate the world, they had to put one arm around the shoulder of the other. In order to navigate the world, they had to put their arms around each other. And this is what I can't get over about these two. They were in it together, like it or not, there was truly only one way for them to move forward. One way for them to move forward where they both could thrive, at least. And that was together, intentionally so. In Jesus' parable, he tells us of a rich landowner reveling in his stores of grain. Grain for today, grain for tomorrow, grain that will ensure his payday now and ensure his wealth in the future. While we might call a person like that prudent or wise today, we might ask them the secret of their financial success and, and copy their efforts. All Jesus seemed to see was a person growing in his self-absorption, a man enamored by his own power and security, absolutely oblivious to his own mortality. Notice the landowner's language in the parable. I will do this. I will put down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And then I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. The rich man had worked hard to curate a kind of individualized security. But Jesus sees here an isolated, insecure fool who had forgotten about human connection. He's forgotten about God's generosity and provision. He's forgotten that possession is hardly stewardship. He's forgotten when enough is enough. And he has forgotten that in the face of death, the great equalizer, that we are all naked paupers before the, our Lord, but for the grace of God. Have you ever heard that phrase, that when you have more than you need, build a longer table, not a taller fence? I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. This all started with a brother demanding his rightful inheritance. But Jesus turns what is practical, a practical legal matter into a lesson on not wasting the opportunity that is present in front of him. The bickering brother has God's very self in his presence, and yet he chose to treat him like an estate lawyer. 
I think the question for us today is what do we miss when we are too busy counting our coins and filling our barns? Our greed and desire for a safety blanket of wealth can isolate us from reality and opportunity. We are called to live a life of presence, one where we have our arms wrapped around the shoulders of our brothers and sisters, partners in moving forward in this world, utterly selfless and together. As Congregationalists, we especially go on and on about our pillar belief in fellowship. How being in community with one another is essential to our faith. Fellowship is our call. It is our imperative. Children of God, in hardship and ease, in times of wonder and uncertainty, in seasons of want and of plenty, when you have been given lemons, or when life has given you a full, sweet pitcher of lemonade, It is imperative that we work together to build that bigger table where there is room for our neighbor. It is imperative that we walk through this world with our arm around the shoulder of our neighbor. Since I name dropped Herman Melville earlier in the sermon, I wanted to close with a thought of his. This is one of my favorite quotes. He said, We cannot live only for ourselves. A thousand fibers connect us all with our fellow man. And in our Hosea passage today, we heard that echoed, that we are bound together with cords of love. And so may it rest on us this week that idea of us having our, sh- our arms around the shoulders of our neighbor. Amen. And let's sing. We're going to be preparing for our time.